Well, we've made it up to Genesis chapter 49. We got to go through uh, 48 this morning. Finished a little at the end of 47 as well. So we have Jacob at the end of his life. And there's certain events and certain conversations that took place that God wants you to hear. So let's see what's next. Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, and then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Verse 8. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his feet and his teeth are whiter than milk. Verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. Verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Verse 19. Gad, a troop, shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your Father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the blessings of your Father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him was separate from his brothers. Verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. and This is what their father spoke to them and he blessed them. And he blessed each one according to his own blessing. And then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. 
There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heb. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So we got to spend some time this morning uh, considering what God laid on Jacob's heart when Jacob knew that he was dying. He was 147 years old, came from a long line of, of folks. Remember, his grandpa made it to be 175. That was it now. His daddy lived to be 180. That was Isaac. He made it to be 147. And if we read just a little bit further in Genesis, Joseph's going to make it to 110. You can kind of see those ages beginning to, to drop there. Uh, part of what we studied this morning uh, started back in Genesis 47, but verse 29 back there said this, When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, So there comes a day that all must die. And, you know, even Methuselah died. I know it took 969 years, but even Methuselah dies. And the reason that's important and that's really something precious is that we are not only made for time. We are not animals just to exist for a short period of time and then everything rots off. We are created in God's image. We are created for eternity. Everyone in this room, everyone hearing this teaching, you are made by God in His image. But what does that mean? Women are made in God's image. Men are made in God's image. The Bible says that God is spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Bible declares that God is eternal. He lasts forever. The real you lasts forever. You have a beginning, but you have no end. God being eternal has no beginning and no end. He always has been. God's beyond us. You know, God is, is, is revealed as God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. God created you as spirit, soul, and body. And his salvation is good for every bit of you. Uh, Jacob, uh, we don't know a whole lot about Jacob in his first 77 years. But he was 77 years old, remember, when he left home. It's 70 years later. And we won't review all that we went over this morning. But he was going over it, how God had led him. And God made a promise in uh, what he called Bethel, which is outside of the town of Luz. How God said that he would bring him back. He would make a mighty nation of him, that he would inherit this land. And he's bearing testimony to that. He had a very unique last 70 years, different than his first 77 years. He spent uh, a few decades fighting the Lord, still trying to be the old Jacob for God, till he finally came to an end and surrendered unto the Lord. And when he was helpless, remember when the Lord came and wrestled with him, and he clung and he asked for a blessing. And that's all he could do was basically humble himself and beg and cry out for mercy and God is always touched by that kind of hard attitude. From that point on, it was a different man said that he, he limped the rest of his life because remember how God humbled him. He just touched him and his hip went out of joint. That's the biggest joint you got. You talk about pain, you're down, you're out for the count. God literally had to restore that, had to put his hip back in when he releases him. But it says the rest of his life, he walked with a limp. He, he had, God had humbled him. He was now Israel, the one whom God commands. You see, the emphasis is on God commanding him. God works with his people, molds and shapes his people, disciplines his people, so that they might be fruitful not only for time, but for eternity. And so he learned. So he raised his, his last two boys different than the first ten. Joseph, of course, being six when they, when they came out. And uh, Benjamin being born shortly after they had come out and his mama dies in childbirth outside of, of Bethlehem. Jacob goes back over all of these things. And he declares that the Lord has had been very faithful to him. Uh, a little portion of his testimony that we consider this morning was Genesis 48. 
And in verse 15, it says, He blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When you and I study after Genesis 49, Many times we're going to start seeing the term the half-tribe of Ephraim, the half-tribe of Manasseh. Rather than saying the tribe of Joseph, there's the terminology half-tribe of Manasseh, half-tribe of Ephraim. And we discovered because Jacob adopted the boys as his own, so they received a full portion. They were not considered to be grandsons. They got the blessing of sons. Joseph got the double portion of the firstborn and all of that we say he's trying to wrap up all the loose ends here at the end of his life his body is weak it says his eyes are dim he would be what we call legally blind but he was full of the spirit of God and the day came that he was to die and he calls his sons together and the last thing he has to say his last words are recorded and it's a prophecy blessing kind of thing that we just read some of the things they might like to hear and some of the things they probably didn't want to hear uh, some were encouragement some were rebuke but they were all by the Holy Spirit you could spend a pretty long time on this prophecy but we can just hit some highlights you'll notice 12 sons are made mention of when we get down to the the blessings upon Joseph and him being uh, having you know so large and so many blessings, Ephraim and Manasseh are included in that. And of course, they're very large tribes. Uh, and because so many blessings did fall upon Ephraim and Manasseh, very often that was the blessing. May God bless you, as Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, later on, as we read the history of the nation of Israel, sometimes the title Ephraim is substituted for the entire nation because of the blessing. Though Ephraim was the second born of Joseph, remember he received that blessing uh, as the firstborn, because he would be greater than Manasseh. Both would be a great people, but Ephraim would be greater. Uh, this is an unusual uh, order that is here. It's not a birth order. It's by basically by moms. Uh, by the names of their mother. There are six sons that are listed first by Leah, one son by Bila, the two sons of Zilpah, one more son by Bila, and then the two sons of Rachel. And sometimes people say, what's the significance? And I don't have a clue. Uh, they're, they're listed differently in different places. It is the way he remembered, and it is the order that he blessed them in. But this is not the exact birth order. You know, there are some that are listed in, in front of others. But it's very clear that God had something to say to each of these men through Jacob. There has to be something beyond that because it's been recorded. There has to be something that God would say to his people in every generation. It's just like what we studied this morning was a private conversation between a father and a son and two grandsons, and yet we know every word. God says, uh, I want my people to hear this. I want them to hear me speaking to their hearts in their life, that they would learn some of these lessons. So God recorded the conversation, preserved the, con the conversation, and then brings it forth in a language that his people thinking. So folks who, who are in China, they'll be studying it in Chinese. And folks, you know, in Mexico, they'll be studying in Spanish. But we think in English, so, you know, we study in English. I'm so glad that God always speaks to us in the language we think in. God knows every language. You know, he, if he, he starts conversing with me in Swahili, I'm in big trouble. You know, I can appreciate his presence, but I don't have a clue, you know, what he's saying to me. I, I need to hear from him in the language that I think in. So the command is, uh, he called all his sons together and he says that he was going to tell them what would befall them in the last days or latter days. 
Remember, Genesis is a book of firsts. We have all these firsts. This is the first time this terminology is used anywhere in Scripture. But you have a bunch of firsts in Genesis. That makes sense. It's the book of beginnings. And then you, you can begin to trace, you know, as God builds on those concepts. So he calls them together. Uh, he says, gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel your father. Now many times after his name is changed, we get some clues as to what, is, what portion is ministering. You know, in the flesh he is Jacob. And in the flesh, of course, he fathered these boys. But in the spirit, he is known as Israel. He says, I, I know you're here because you're my physical children, but I'm about to prophesy unto you as Israel. This is not something in the flesh. This is being said by the Holy Spirit. He does start with Reuben. And he says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. It starts off, hey, this doesn't sound too bad. And then it just falls apart. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. Well, why? Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Remember back in Genesis 35, and all we can do is just summarize briefly some of these things here. But Reuben slept with his, his dead so concubine. And there was a rebuke you know, for that. And never forgotten made a difference, made a change. And uh, if you want a parallel of the history, you know, from this time on, if you ever get to Chronicles, in, in First Chronicles, about the fifth chapter, sixth chapter in there, you're going to have a list of each of these boys and their children for several generations that's recorded in the book of Chronicles, which gives you a little more, you know, idea. Uh, there, no major leader ever came from the tribe of Reuben. No judge's name, no great warrior, no major leader, no king is ever mentioned coming from the book of Reuben. Uh, and they, they were just not solid. Unstable means always moving as water. In fact, the term unstable is oil. So you kind of get that picture of, you know, that, that water's really moving. It's, it's not stable. Next is Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Uh, again, without going back to all the gory details, we studied again further back in Genesis that when Dinah, their, their sister, was molested by a man, but then he fell in love with her, remember? And he wanted to marry her. And he actually came to ask them, what, you know, what do I need to do? And what the brothers said, well, you know, we're all in covenant with God, and you'd have to become like us, and all you guys are going to have to be circumcised and enter into a covenant with God, and then we'll let you marry our sister. And evidently, they, you know, that town and that dad and that boy who fell in love with the daughter, they all agreed to that. Well, while they're recovering from their wounds, Levi and Simeon went in and killed them. Killed the men. Took the town. And their dad rebuked them. He says, you've made us a stench in the nostrils of our neighbors. How are we ever going to live this thing down? I mean, they're, they are going to hate us. And they said, well, they don't treat our sister that way. There won't be any of this. And so they, they come across as, man, we're, we're going to take action. And whatever we ought to do, and if we got to take them out, we're going to take them out. Now, those guys mellowed some as they got older. But there is this, this anger that is made mention of there. And then it talks about sometimes just, you know, of course, you, you ruin your neighbor's ox if you hamstring it. Know, that hamstring that's on the back side. They can't pull any weight, can't get around. All it can do is, is hobble. Uh, it says, Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. It says, You guys don't think. you got to be real careful with anger, don't you? Anger puts your brain on hold. Scripture says, Be angry and sin not. 
Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. You've got to be really careful with anger because what alcohol can do to your body, anger can do to your brain. And there are things that people will do when they're angry that they would never do if they were calm. And then that they calm down and say, well, I'm sorry, you made me mad. Well, you're still responsible for your actions. And there are consequences that can carry on in your family, maybe for a long time. And, and Simeon and Levi ended up handling this two different ways. If you look at the history of Simeon, uh, it, it is by the second census, the, the tribe of Simeon, and the second and first census are found in the book of Numbers, you know, the first census and the second census. Simeon was the smallest of the tribes. Uh, it had its own inheritance when they came out of Egypt later, but they, they lost that and they got assimilated into the tribe of Judah as you read their history. Levi went in a different direction because the prophecy is they're going to be scattered among the tribes. And in the book of Exodus, we are told when, when Moses came down uh, and they were all partying, and he had those Ten Commandments, and he got mad, and he broke them, and then he pronounced his judgment. Remember what he called for? He says, every man get your sword and come to me. Whoever's with me, Lord, come over here. Now, who's ever been in charge of this, who's ever been doing it, even if it's your own brother, you're going to slay. And it says there were, there were 3,000 that died. The only group that came were the men from Levi. The men from Levi came, and they're the ones who took care of that, and then God says that because they were faithful unto him, that they would be the priests. They would be the ones that were separated. They're the ones who had paid the price. So the way this is fulfilled in them, the way they're scattered is for good. It's not They're not scattered for evil. They're scattered for good. Remember, they're not going to receive their own inheritance. They're going to be scattered among all the people to teach the word, to run the educational system, you know, to be the Lord's representative there. And then they all sent their own representatives uh, to whatever place God designated, first for the tabernacle, then for the temple, to be those that would be on duty to minister. Let's see if we hit a few of these high. Uh, verse 8 says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? It says, the scepter, in other words, the symbol of authority, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And I'll just tell you, it's a reference to the Messiah. Uh, Shiloh is, is a term for to whom it belongs. Okay, to the to the one who will be the ultimate ruler, who will be the ultimate king, the one who will be the king of kings, who will be the Lord of lords. And you'll discover as far as God's chosen kings, start with David. He said, but hold it, now Saul was first. Yeah, but remember the people wanted him. He came from the tribe of Benjamin. But then David and Solomon and all of the that came from them came from Judah. Of course, we have Jesus from the tribe of Judah. And in the book of Revelation, fifth chapter, the lion of the tribe of Judah is a term for Jesus. And it references back to this particular prophecy. Uh, let, let's see if we can hit, i got to watch my time frame here. Let's skip to Zebulun, verse 13. It says, Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea, he shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon are still in the same locations. You get out a map, and they're up on the Mediterranean Sea, and Sidon was already a commercial center. So Zebulun uh, was going to be uh, traders, and, they, and they, there would be commerce, and a lot of that would be linked to the sea and land trade. And Zebulun did go in that direction. They, they, they were known for that. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden, became a band of slaves. Now, Issachar, is, they, they were known as hard workers, even if you look in First Chronicles, that, that seventh chapter is about the place where they show up. Uh, they were known for a hard work ethic. Uh, they, they worked hard not only when they were free, 
but they worked hard when they had to serve others as well. It says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Uh, Dan was active in leadership, but it became false leadership when the nation split and you went for the northern kingdom called Israel. Southern kingdom was, was called Judah. And when the northern kingdom went to Samaria, and then you have the tribe of Dan that went all the way to the north. They, they led in the idol worship, the false worship, to, and told people, don't go down to Jerusalem. You don't have to go there. Uh, they, they led, but they led people astray. Dan drops out. When, when all the, the tribes are mentioned in prophecy again in Revelation, the tribe of Dan is missing. It's not in that list. It, it, it's, it's not there. Uh, it says, Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. And Gad were really known as fierce fighters. The men from the, they, they, uh, they, they were warriors. It says, Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Uh, Asher was really into farming and agriculture. And, and when you see, so much of what is prophesied here is fulfilled when they go into the promised land. Goodness gracious, that's hundreds of years out there in the future. Long after the particular man that they're named for is gone, but he begins to prophesy. It says, Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Uh, again, the men... Uh, from Naphtali were known for their fighting, but also for the education of the poetry. Remember Deborah and Barak are from Naphtali? Uh, and after Deborah's victory, and, and you have that beautiful song of Deborah that's recorded there in the scripture, you read that, I mean, just, uh, it, it's a glorious thing. The, the Spirit's just getting some highlights that he's, he's sharing through Jacob. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, hated him, but his bow remained in strength and his arms of his hands were made strong. It says, by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. It says, by the God of your father who will help you, and by the almighty who will bless you. So it says, God has already manifested these with Joseph. God is the one who preserved Joseph. God is the one who had Joseph be a blessing to those who were round about, very fruitful, using, you know, pictures, that you, things you can see. God's always taking what you can see to explain what you can't see. He always takes things in the physical to explain what's going on in the spiritual. He says this, the, the, those who come forth from Joseph, and remember from this point on, they're going to be referred to, Half tribe of Ephraim, half tribe of Manasseh. All these blessings, all these fruitful blessings, all this population that will come, a lot of kids, a lot of growth, okay, is fulfilled in Manasseh and Ephraim, you know, which come forth from Joseph. It says, uh, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. And the last one he mentions, verse 27, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. And Benjamin were, uh, they were mighty warriors. Uh, if you read their history, they get themselves in a real mess. Uh, in a few places, they are almost annihilated, almost completely wiped out, really in punishment, in judgment for what they did. And God had to step in and preserve them but from Benjamin will come King Saul, first king. And from Benjamin comes the Apostle Paul. Remember, they're both originally called Saul. Saul's name is changed to Paul. Now, there's just highlights here. You can really go deep if you, if you so choose. 
what it lets us know is that God is sovereign. God knows what is coming. Every now and then he gives us a little peek out there. And it just helps us know kind of where we're at along this path as we're serving the Lord. God can not only be trusted with eternity, but God can be trusted with time. God knows everything. God is so far beyond us. You see that you understand that God sees Adam and Armageddon all at the same time. Oh, you, you think about it for a little bit and your brain just kind of fizzles. The, the good thing is, you know, if you get worried about the future, the only thing I know for sure about next week is that Jesus is already there. The only thing I know for sure about a month from now, Jesus is already there. How about five years from now, ten years from now, hundred years from now? Jesus is already there. You can have fellowship with Jesus tonight, today, with Him. You can follow His instructions and be assured that you are right where you need to be. To be right in the center of God's will for out there in the future. See, we can trust God not only with eternity, we can trust God with time. And He reminds us every now and then in, in things like this that He knows what's coming. If some of it sounds as judgment, remember when God pronounces judgment, his goal is repentance. And so if some changes need to be made, you repent. So you can be right in the center of God's will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you've got everything under control. Every now and then you give us a little glimpse of things that are to come. Here a long time ago, you gave uh, 12 men a glimpse of things that were to come after a nation came forth from them. Many of these things are still to be fulfilled, and many have been fulfilled. But Lord, you've got the short-term prophecies right, and we know you're going to get the, the long-term prophecies right. So thank you for caring enough to let us know what's on your heart. Please help us to know what's right, and give us power by your Holy Spirit to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name.